Uh, hi guys, I'm Mitya Korshek. I'm here to tell you a story. The story is going to be about a vulnerability class that our company has researched for almost two years now. And it's called binary planting, and you can also uh, hear, from, uh, hear of it uh, under names of DLL hijacking, DLL spoofing, DLL preloading, insecure library loading, and many other names. So just by show of hand, who has uh, ever heard of any of these terms? Excellent, because this means we're doing some of job correctly in raising awareness about this vulnerability. So this vulnerability is very interesting to us. It has all it takes to become a vulnerability superstar. Why? It allows for arbitrary code execution, and I mean arbitrary. Whatever you want executed, you can get it done. It's very easy to find. At least most of its in instances are easy to find. And it's also very easy to exploit. And it's extremely reliable. So forget about bi uh, buffer overflows. It's hard work. Binary planting, it's really easy. It requires no privileges on part of the attacker. And it can be done remotely and even through firewalls. So what else does a vulnerability need to become a superstar? Well, this one is not a superstar, actually. Even though we found over 100 billion instances of this vulnerability, and I'll tell you the math behind it later, it has been, in 12 years of its public existence, it has been misunderstood by developers, underestimated by security experts, downplayed by some security vendors, uh, software vendors, I'm sorry, ignored by others, and finally forgotten about by most people. So we said, let's make this right. Let's look into this, and let's see if the injustice is actually done. Three months ago, we published our research, and some other researchers also did that as well. And after that, this vulnerability has been quasi-addressed by Microsoft. They provided a partial fix to fix a part of the entire problem. It is still being ignored by most software vendors. And even though over, at least, uh, I mean, over 200 vulnerabilities of this type have been fully disclosed and can be found on the internet and exploited as well, most of them are still unfixed. If you go to our blog, our latest po blog post uh, gives you some statistics on how badly vendors are fixing this. So what's going on here? To see what's going on here, let's go back to the beginning. 12 years ago, National Security Agency published a paper called Windows Anti-Security Guidelines, which was probably one of the first sources to public, publicly mention this type of vulnerability. It was called DLS spoofing then, but never mind that. In 2000, Georgi Guninsky, we know about him, right? Everyone's heard about Georgi Guninsky. He found two office bugs of this type and published that, and Microsoft fixed that, but it didn't actually cause an avalanche, which it could have. A lot of stuff has happened since today, and uh, Microsoft has along the way introduced some partial fix uh, to make things a little better, but just a little better, as we'll see. So in the course of our research, which started in December 2008, we've accumulated over 520 bugs in various widely used pieces of software, bugs of this particular type. And uh, in April 2010, this year, it became obvious that once we publish our research, it'll be important for users to have at least some remedy available. So we approached Microsoft and gave them an opportunity to, to familiarize themselves with our research and to, to get a feeling of how ubiquitous this problem really is and start working on some remedy. So they did. And in summary, in over 10 years of, public, of the public existence of this vulnerability, less than 10 bugs, we, we were able to find less than 10 public reports of this type of vulnerability. So it was really not widely known. It was mostly considered to be local instead of remote, and only a part of the problem was being understood. In August this year, which is over three months ago, Apple fixed the iTunes bug that we reported to them. This was just one of the, the many reports that we sent to vendors. 
and we published our uh, report on their fix as well, which at, in the same day caused HD Moore, which we all know, to reveal that he was also doing research on this same vulnerability and he found 40 vulnerable applications. So he published that and there was no reason for us, once the cat was out of the bug, as he said, to withhold the, the, our research to ourselves. So we published our results as well. And this was, this was probably uh, why some of you have raised your hands saying that you know about it. Now what is the actual cause of this vulnerability? What, what's the underlying reason of this? Do we have any developers here? Come on, don't be ashamed. Yeah, have you ever used load library function or have ever, okay, we have some nods there. Yeah, of course you have. Loading libraries is a very good thing, right? Because someone else has done their work and we just reuse their work and that's like, that's, that's good capitalism. That's okay. So what happens when you call load library? If you provide a full path to the library, then this particular library is just going to be loaded and executed and that's okay. So that doesn't interest us. What interests us is when load library is called with a relative name. For example, as we have here, just the name of the library. What happens then? Well, in this case, Windows are really friendly and really helpful and they think instead of the developer. So the load library function is very clever. Sorry. It's very clever. It's, it's going out of its way to find the library that you're trying to load. It basically thinks so that you don't have to. And how does it do that? It has a specific search order which it searches in order to find your library. And this is it. We have six points. We have six locations in this search order. First, the directory where the application has been launched from. Then the three system directories. And then in location number five, we have the current working directory. And finally, we have the path, which includes the application path, system path, user path, and process path. Now, do you remember those IQ tests where you have six shapes in front of you and have to say which one stands out? Well, the current working directory obviously stands out. Why? Because this is the only potentially dangerous location. If you have your permissions set correctly, oh, it's sliding, right? Okay. We have an attack. If you have permissions set correctly on your computer, then no one without admin privileges will be able to plant a malicious DLL in any one of the initial four locations. And also, unless an application was stupid enough to change your path so that something, some attacker controlled location is included in the path, then that is off limits to attackers as well. But current working directory, which is unknown to, to many people, can not only point to a location on a local file system, it can also point to a remote share. Moreover, it can point to a remote share on a server in China. Well, I'm not, I'm not singling out China, I'm just saying a remote server anywhere on the internet. So what am I implying? Am I implying that your perfectly friendly and trustworthy application running on your computer can at some point decide to connect to a server somewhere on the other side of the planet, download a DLL without you ever approving that and launching that DLL? Yes, that's exactly what I'm implying. That is what binary planting, at least remote binary planting, is about. If it's any consolation, before 2004, it was even worse because the search order had the current working directory in location number two. So Microsoft decided to change that to what they call safe search order. It's a safer search order, but is it safe? Now we have to think about it. Why wouldn't it be safe? I mean, if an application trying to load the library with a relative path doesn't find the DLL in those first four locations, isn't it trying to load a DLL that doesn't even exist? And why would an application want to do that? It would have to be a brain dead application no? 
There are many, many reasons why applications are trying to load DLLs that aren't there on the system. Let's look at some of the most prevalent ones. We've seen many cases where the developer just tries to load a library in order to determine whether some functionality or some feature is available on the system. It's the easiest thing to do. And it's how a real capitalist developer should be doing their work with minimum effort. So I'll just call load library, try to load the DLL. If it's there, if the operation is successful, I, I will use the functions provided by that library. If it's not successful, I will just forget about it. It sounds okay, and functionally, that's, that's what you should do. That's optimal. But from security perspective, that's really bad because if the DLL is not on the system, it will be eventually looked for in the current working directory, which is bad. For those of you who, who have read about binary planting or DLL hijacking, you see that we have many cases of vulnerable applications trying to load dwmapi.dll, which is uh, a DLL that, is, that exists as a system DLL from Microsoft that exists on all Windows uh, Vista and Windows 7 systems, but doesn't exist on Windows XP and older systems. So if you write an application that is supposed to work on all those systems, and especially at this point uh, today, if you build an Microsoft Foundation Classes application with Visual Studio, your application will automatically be vulnerable because, because Microsoft's library is going to try to load this DLL whenever the application is launched. We've seen cases where applications can become vulnerable if you install them only partially. So you, you'd select a custom install and you say, I want this component, I don't want this component installed, but the installed component is going to assume that the other component has also been, been installed and it will try to load its DLLs. Its DLLs aren't there, so they are looked for in the current working directory. We've seen cases of backward and forward compatibility. If you uh, notice the Microsoft Office 2010 bug, which was uh, revealed two weeks ago, it was a case of, probably a case of forward compatibility because the Office was trying to load some DLLs that haven't been known by anyone on the internet i.e. Google, right? So there are no information about those DLLs, so it's likely that those DLLs were just planned to be included in a, a, a later version or a later update of uh, Visual Studio. Then we have some applications that decide to look for the DLLs in the path. But if we remember the search path, the path is in location number six, and the current working directory is in location number five. So anything you try to load from the path is going to be preempted by the current working directory. So all those applications are by default vulnerable. We've seen funny cases like this. Applications trying to be portable across platform using the same code on Windows and Linux. We've seen them trying to load Linux libraries on Windows systems. It's pretty funny. Then we have applications making wrong assumptions about installed components, like media players just assuming that some codecs will be available on the system. Well, they, they're careful. They don't break if they don't find these codecs, but they just become vulnerable. They don't even know it. And then we have incomplete uninstalls. You uninstall an application and it forgets to unregister some DLL that isn't there anymore. Pretty bad. There are a lot of other reasons but a very problematic reason in terms of your trying to get rid of these bugs in your applications is that you have many closed source third party components that you include in your applications and you cannot easily get rid of vulnerabilities in those. So how does a binary planting attack look like? It's a three step attack. First of all, you're an attacker. You have to plant a malicious DLL to some location under your control. Let's say a remote Windows share. Second, you have to somehow get the vulnerable application on a user's computer to, get, to set the current working directory to the location of your DLL. That sounds tricky. And the last one is easy. You just have to wait. You just have to wait for that application to actually load your DLL. Now, obviously, step number two is the critical one here. How do you set the current working directory? 
Well, most people don't even care where the current working directory is in an application. It's not some property that would easily be seen. Users don't know, are not aware where the current working directory is, is pointing to. They don't even care. It doesn't affect their, their use of the product. Developers often don't even care as well. Current working directory is actually something that should have been gone a long time ago. It's just staying with us because of backward compatibility. Because if we get rid of it right now, mo many applications will break. Now, how do we set the current working directory to some location of, under our control? The most easy way to do this is to get the user to double click some document, to open some document on a remote share. How do you do that? Well, we'll see about it later. But double clicking any file in Windows Explorer automatically sets the current working directory of the launched application to that location. It sounds okay, it, makes, it even makes sense because that application can then easily open other files that are in the same location just by using relative names. So it's easy for the developers and many applications are actually doing that. The other way to set the current working directory is to use file open or file save dialogs. Those, if you're observing how current working directory is being changed, you can see that as you browse through your file system or through the network using those dialogs, the current working directory follows your steps and it stays there by default. You can change that if you're a developer, but it stays, it stays there by default if you confirm the action, so if you actually open or save the file. And some applications also are friendly enough to change the current working directory to the location where you last saved or opened the file. There are also many other ways where, how applications are changing their current working directory and some of those can actually also be exploited. Now to an actual attack. We have an internal network here. Now we have a user and a file server and an attacker in the same network, so we have an internal attack. We have users, many users, we see just one of them here, using the file server for sharing their documents. So we have uh, the user uh, sharing a document.txt on this share and trying to open it by double clicking, for example. That's his document, right? We're not doing any social engineering here. But suppose the application that he's using for opening this document is vulnerable to binary planting. Now all the attacker has to do is to place a malicious DLL on the same share alongside the document and wait for the user to open the document. So when the user opens the document, his vulnerable application is going to load the DLL from the share and execute it. Zero social engineering. But it goes remote as well. Why does this work over internet? Don't your firewalls block SMB traffic? Yes, they do. But do they block web dev traffic? They probably don't. They usually don't. The firewalls that we've seen don't. Because it, it doesn't feel dangerous, so it's better not be blocked. Web dev is actually an extension to HTTP, so if you're allowing outbound HTTP and not setting specific restrictions for web dev, then you're also allowing outbound web dev. And there's no way for the firewall to tell the good from the bad. Now what we have here on this picture, we have the same internal network at the lower si uh, side of the slide, and we have the internet on the upper side of the slide. So the attacker just sets up a web server, enables web dev, creates a share on the server, and then he has to get the user to access that share. He can use that, he can do that, for example, by sending an email providing a link to some interesting files and the user will click the link and, he, and Windows Explorer will show the remote share. There is no way the, the, the user can tell that this share, can easily tell that this share is on the internet because it looks the same. And why does it work? Because Windows, Windows workstations, have by default a very special service running which is called web client. Well, if you haven't heard about it, never mind because you're never probably never using it. But what it does is a little magic. It helps you. If you try to access a remote share, 
and SMB protocol doesn't reach that share, it tries with WebDAV automatically. It doesn't ask you anything. So the only thing you see is a slight delay, if you see that. So you see the remote share, and you see the files, and you trust them, because yeah, everything you've seen in, in shares so far has been in the internal network, and you trust those files. So you double-click the document, and what happens then? The application tries to load a non-existing DLL and eventually tries to, to search the current working directory, which is on the internet. China. So, so what are the attack vectors? How does the, how does the attacker implement this attack? We've seen an internal attack, an external attack. There are some other ideas as well. Let's we'll just cover them all. Well, not all. When you provide a link to a remote share, you can obviously do this in a website. So a user visits a website and clicks on a link, sees a share, double clicks a document, bang. You can do this in email, you can do this in any instant message. In an internal attack, you can plant a DLL on a file server. We've seen that. But you have some like remote local attacks. If someone gives you a, send you a zip archive, or gives you a USB stick or uh, any, any kind of removable media, uh, that media automatically becomes local to your computer, right? So it doesn't even have to go through the firewall. If you get a CD with a bunch of uh, interesting uh, Word files that you would really want to see, and uh, you just double click one of those because, well, that should be a safe operation to do. Uh, then the DLL, which is also hidden on the, on the CD, also gets loaded. You can use binary planting also for the old-fashioned local privilege escalation. If you want to become a local admin, you just set a trap like this to your admin and just wait for him to launch a local vulnerable application. And then, this hasn't been released yet, but our researchers, uh, our research has, is not over yet. Uh, our researchers are now focused on trying to find attack vectors that make things even easier for attackers to eliminate social engineering as much as we can. So we've come to the point where a uh, Windows XP user only has to visit a website with Internet Explorer and click twice somewhere, anywhere on the web page. And clicking on web pages is not some outrageously unthinkable operation. We do that all the time. You have to do that and the DLL is downloaded and executed on your computer. So it, it's getting worse, and, and we shouldn't rely on people trying to, uh, being able to detect social engineering because we're eliminating social, social engineering from these attacks. Now for a demo. Have any of you tried our online exposure test? Excellent. Did it work? It didn't work. Yay. You're in the minority. But obviously, the security people are likely to have their configurations better set than the rest of them. Now the demo. It's actually a video. I'm cheating a little. What we have here is a .vcf file, which is associated with a Windows address book. And when you double-click a .vcf file, a Windows address book, which is integrated in uh, Windows XP, and also similar applications are in Windows 7 and Vista, uh, just open the file and show, your, show the content of the file like this. Now, we monitor with the process monitor what happens when Windows address book tries to load a DLL, a specific DLL, wap32res.dll. It tries to find it in the in the home directory of the application, but it can't. And the system, system32 windows, it isn't found there. Then it tries the current working directory, on the share in this case. But it doesn't find it. So it's vulnerable, but it didn't, didn't exploit it. Now let's put this DLL with this exact name alongside the VCF file and double click it again. That's the delay, yeah. That's what happens. Instead of a real DLL, the actual legitimate DLL, our DLL was loaded and executed, and it showed the hack dialog. And in the process monitor, you can see this as well. You can see that 
the DLL has been found on a remote share, and finally, the load the image operation is the operation that actually executes this DLL. So that's pretty cool. Looks easy, right? I told you, it's not buffer overflow magic. This is really easy. Anyone can do this. So up to this point, we were talking about DLLs. We have to shift now to expand our attack surface a little. It's not just about DLLs. Executable launching also have similar problems. They're just worse than with DLLs. That's the only difference. Because today, the search order, when you try to call create process and launch uh, an executable without providing a full path, the search path will include the current working directory in location number two. Number two. So if the executable is not found in the application's home directory, in other words, if it's not one of the executables that's been installed with the application, but for example, explorer.exe or notepad or calculator, those are not to be found in location number one. Those are in location number three or number four. So anytime you create process is called with a relative path and trying to launch an application that is not in the, in, in the original application's home directory, we have a binary planting vulnerability. Shell execute is even worse. The current working directory is in location number one. What does that mean? If you call shell execute and try to execute notepad.exe, which is a fairly common thing to do for an application, or launch a calculator, or launch cmd.exe, if you do not provide a full path, then this executable will be searched for in the current working directory first. And only if it's not found there, it will be found in one of the system directories. So the only thing preventing these calls from being exploitable is if it's difficult to set the current working directory to an attacker controlled location. But it very often isn't. Now there are many other functions, new and old ones, that can be used for launching uh, executables. And all of them, at least all of those that, that we looked into, have a, you are using a search order. So they are vulnerable. They include current working directory. Now a few words about our research. What we did when we tried to assess the ubiquity of this vulnerability is we looked at over 200 widely used applications. We just tried to cover everything that's really as widely used as possible, as popular as possible. So we, we looked at commercial and freeware stuff, open source, closed source, everything we could download as trials and everything we had as licensed software. So we tested all of these and we found at least one binary planting issue in almost everyone, to be precise, in nine out of 10. That's pretty bad because the 200 sample it's not a small sample, actually. I, I wouldn't dare call it a representative sample if you were a bunch of statistic analysts, but I can call that to you, and you're going to take my word for it. So if it's, if it's an indicator, then nine out of 10 reasonably complex applications in the world, Windows applications in the world, are currently vulnerable. It helps if the application is not complex, Hello world application, if it's not loading any DLLs, for, might be reasonably safe. But if you build it in, in a Visual Studio as a Microsoft Foundation Classes application, it will become vulnerable because of their application, their DLL being included in it. We only scratched the surface. We didn't have time for free work so much. Uh, to look uh, further into these applications. So we just basically opened the files that, that were associated with these applications and tried to see if any DLLs or executables were loaded. And then we just browsed around the menus and did some, some stuff that was pretty obvious and easy, easily reachable and see if there were any suspicious loadings going on. So in these 200 plus applications, we found over 520 binary planting issues. So there were in average, 
more than two vulnerabilities in each of these applications. To make our lives a little less miserable, we developed a tool to help us monitor these processes and detect how current working directory is being changed and whether any loadings from the current working directory are being uh, performed. So this was a real time saver. This is our tool, just snapshot, just to see that I'm not making this up. I did it in a Visio yesterday. So about DLL exit planting ratio, it was a kind of a surprise to us. We expected, well, first of all, we started with DLL planting issues and we found a bunch of those. And then we said, okay, let's look at the executable planting issues. And we didn't really expect to find many because when you think of it, DLLs are being loaded all the time. When you launch Microsoft Office, for example, probably about 500 DLLs are being loaded. They are not actually, these actions are not all seen uh, by, uh, on the file system because if a DLL is loaded once and it's again attempted to be loaded uh, later, it's not going to be looked for on the file system. It, it is cached already. But if the first load didn't uh, happen, then the second one would actually go to the file system. That's what I mean by, by how many times an, uh, libraries are being loaded. But executables, we, did, we didn't expect applications to launch many new executables. Well, you do see applications launching calculators, notepads, CMDs, explorers, and so on. We do see that. But we didn't expect many of those to be vulnerable. But anyway, they were. So one quarter, approximately, of all binary planting bugs that we found were exit planting bugs. And why is this important? Because the current remedies available to you and to everyone to protect against binary planting bugs are all focused on DLLs. You can't do anything right now to change the behavior of executable loading. You can do something about DLLs. So how many bugs we said? 100 billion? How do you get that number? Okay, we took out, out of the, all, all the vulnerable applications that we found, we took the about 20 most widely used ones uh, and we tried to find the, the, num the, the install base for these applications, just multiply that with the number of bugs we found in them. So when you consider that just Windows operating systems have a pretty huge install base combined about two billion, well, you could argue about it, but it, it doesn't matter if it's 100 billion or 50 billion, it's a lot. If you put it in euros, well, that'd be nice. So how much is 100 billion? I, I have problems imagining that. So if you imagine 9 million bicyclists in Beijing, which you probably can, you just multiply that by 11,000. That's how many binary planting bugs just we found and we just scratched the surface, really. We just probably inspected 1% of, of representative software that is being used widely. And what does this mean? This means that every one of your Windows computers, anyone using Windows? Don't be shy, don't be shy. I'm not ashamed to admit. Okay, I'm going to assume that we have a couple of guys not using Windows at all, and they just came here to, to laugh at us all. <laughs> but the rest of us have definitely have hundreds of binary planting bugs on our computers today that can be exploited, possibly even from the internet, to execute arbitrary code on our computers in the context of our user accounts. This also means that there are tens of thousands of ways to break into every bank, every network, every agency, and every critical infrastructure in the world, which is pretty cool. Uh, ever heard of Stuxnet? I think you have. But did you know that Stuxnet is using binary planting uh, vulnerability in one of uh, Siemens products for uh, propagation and for resilience? That's pretty cool. It's not the first bug, actually. Uh, remember NIMDA? NIMDA was, uh, yeah, well, 
the young ones among you don't, but the seniors do. Nimda was uh, a very famous worm, uh, and it actually used binary planting bug for propagation uh, as one of the vectors, not, not the only one. So which vendors are affected? Well, the list would be shorter. Uh, this is obviously not, not the whole list. The list would be shorter if the question was reversed. Who isn't affected? Well, whoever's just, well, we're not affected because we don't develop anything. Yeah, that's a pretty surefire way to, to avoid it. And uh, you will find the, about 100 uh, affected vendors on Secunia's website, and we found 100 more in our research. So it's pretty ubiquitous. So this is the problem, right? Now, what can you do? I don't want to leave you uh, hanging out there and just uh, going all depressed on me and, and saying, now I, I want to kill myself, I can't do anything. Because, uh, no, uh, it's a joke, but a little bit seriously, we in security are, are very frequently just focused on our laying out the problems and uh, leaving it at that. Uh, probably because there often are few solutions available. But uh, I think we should just uh, try to, to find as many protection methods as we can for, any, for every problem that we're aware of. So uh, I'm just appealing to you guys, if you have any additional ideas on how, to, how uh, developers, uh, users, and admins could uh, get rid of these problems or make their exploitations uh, less likely or, or more difficult, it would be nice if you, if you came forward. Now, what do we know that you can do? Of course, we have these guidelines on our, on our uh, website as well, so, so we frequently update that. Well, not frequently anymore because we ran out of ideas, but the updated data is there. If you are developers, and those, those of you who, who dare to raise your hands, that you actually are developers, can do the following. Oh. Yeah, thank you. You definitely should try to use absolute paths whenever you're loading libraries or launching executables. If you don't know where your DLLs and executables are, you don't know what you're doing. Seriously, you have to know what you're about to load. It, it doesn't just have to pass the QA test. It will work if you do it like this. But if the DLLs aren't there, it will break. I mean, it will be vulnerable. So please use absolute paths. Use those environment variables to, to create those absolute paths, but, but do it. Don't just, let, don't just let load library and other loading functions to use their own intelligence, because they're stupid. They're very friendly, very helpful, but they're stupid. Next. Don't just try to load the library to see if it's there. Well, if you do the first thing, if you, if you uh, provide an absolute path to a library, you are allowed to do that. If you, if you just want to see if a specific DLL is in the Windows System 32 directory, feel free to, to call load library and see if it's there or if it's not. But never do that with a relative path. Next. Sometimes it's difficult for applications, especially for libraries that are going to be included in other products, to find their own DLLs because they will sometimes be loaded, sometimes they'll be loaded from one application, sometimes from another application, but their DLLs are somewhere entirely else. So there, what some of them do is they add to the process path, the location of those DLLs. But it ends up in the path. The path is number six. Current working directory is number five. You are vulnerable, so don't do that. Don't try to, don't try to load anything from the path, actually. When you start your application, set the current working directory to some safe location, for example, system root. If you do that, and your application doesn't break, then you're okay. And just make sure that, you, that this current working directory cannot be changed to some attacker control location later. Do use the setDLL directory function at the very beginning of your code. 
because that eliminates the current working directory from the, that removes it from the search path, which is a good idea. It doesn't work for exit planting. Never use search path. I'm expanding this. Just never use search path for anything. Do your own searching. When you develop your product and you test it, just use some process monitor or any monitoring tool to see what it's doing, how it's loading their libraries and executables. Just, you have to control that. And then use the Microsoft uh, hotfix and set it to max, which will break a lot of applications. If it breaks your application, then fix your application. It has to work with Microsoft's tool set to max. And you have to do this for all modules of your product, not just one of them. Admins, any admins, anyone administering their own computer at least, I think all of you do, just lying, In, do install Microsoft's hotfix and remember to configure it. It will prevent loading libraries from current working directory from uh, on remote shares, which is a very good thing to do. It can even completely remove current working directory from the search path, but it will break some web applications. Do disable the web client service, and do use Windows Software Restriction Policy on Windows XP and App Locker on Windows 7. Those are the, the most important things to do. And if you can, block the web dev traffic. If you're users, you cannot do much. So apart from the, the usual uh, being careful restrictions, uh, the third one is really specific here. If you are provided um, a folder or, or a source with interesting documents, don't just open them from that location. Copy those files to your local system, open them from there, so that DLLs remain in the remote location. Now here are a couple of resources that you can look into. Uh, our blog is full of additional details that uh, we have no time explaining here, so if you're interested, uh, we are constantly revealing our research there. These are a couple of tools that you can use. These are all free tools for finding and, and exploiting these bugs. And finally, uh, the test that I mentioned is still online. It exploits a, a vulnerability uh, that uh, has been known for three months in Windows address book that we looked into before. So if you want to test the, your exposure, uh, the exposure of your computer um, to remote binary planting attacks, you just visit our test page and do the test. And uh, if it doesn't work, then you're probably a security expert. If it works, then you probably didn't cheat. And please tell your friends, tell your colleagues, tell developers, tell admins about this, because this is a huge pile of bugs that we're not going to get rid of for a long, long time. Because if Microsoft did remove current working directory from the search order, which they could, they could easily do that with a single update, so many applications would break that they cannot afford that. So all those applications first have to be fixed. They are not vulnerable. They are just relying on loading libraries and executables from the current working directory. So thank you very much. Uh, this was my presentation. Uh, we have time for questions? Excellent. Yes, I think we have some time for questions. Um, where is Carrie? <laughs> I'm sorry, does she have questions? Um, any questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, oh, a bit of full disclosure, actually. I, I work for Microsoft, but uh, uh, so I, I was just interested in the, you had a, you had one um, bullet point that was uh, advanced binary planting techniques. It was a bit enigmatic, and you mentioned some detail about it, but not very much detail. Could you expand on that a bit more? Um, f uh, non full disclosure, no. <laughs> <laughs> We, we will tell you more about this. Uh, we will contact Microsoft Director as well about a few of those things. So uh, I will tell Martin that you did your job. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, currently, uh, currently we're, uh, we're just uh, trying to, we're running actually an experiment on the site. We decided not to uh, reveal most of the bugs 
that we found to the vendors. And what is the experiment? We're, we're also not, not giving those bugs to anyone else. So we're sitting on them. And, and why are we doing this? Because this is a unique opportunity to compare what vendors do when their vulnerabilities are publicly known, i.e. Secunia's list and other lists of publicly known vulnerabilities, as opposed to those that we know exist, but vendors probably don't. So we want to see, at least in one case, how vendors who haven't been publicly smashed on the head with their vulnerabilities are picking up the knowledge about potential issues. We're trying to gauge their proactiveness, actually. And we're, we're continuing with this experiment. We're just going to add some more fire, some more fuel to the fire, uh, and, and try to gain more awareness, more, more, uh, more people engaged in this product. So to hopefully see that some of this knowledge actually spills over to those who don't even think they're affected. That's, that's what we're doing right now. So it, it doesn't help you, but it explains a little bit why we're doing this. Any other questions? Any more questions? So uh, you told us that most uh, applications built with, uh, with uh, development studio are Visual vulnerable? Studio. Visual Studio are uh, vulnerable? Only, only those uh, built as, a, as MFC applications, okay. like Microsoft Foundation classes. The reason for that is, is in uh, is an MFC uh, library, which is included uh, in all of those. Uh, and, and this one, uh, this library has a vulnerability. It, it tries to load the dwmapi.dll. So um, the, if you're a developer, you have two ways of building such applications. The MFC can be statically or dynamically linked. If it's dynamically linked, then it's actually going to, then, then the MFC code, the vulnerable code, is not going to be, the, be included into your executable. But your executable will expect the uh, MFC redistributables to be present on the user's machine or your applications, uh, application won't work. So it, it will be fairly easy for Microsoft to fix those because with a sim single update to, to those redistributables, they can fix your vulnerable application. But if you statically link an MFC application, then the vulnerable code will actually be included in your executable. And uh, I don't think it'll be easy or even possible for Microsoft to fix that. So they will have to fix the Visual Studio and you will have to, or the developers will have to rebuild their applications with, their fixed, with the fixed MFC code and redistribute, redistribute that to, to all their users. Uh, question. Uh, on the Unix side, you can do similar stuff with the LD uh, environment variables. Mm -hmm. Is there something similar in Windows where I can set some environment var variables to override some of this, this behavior? Not, so to can... not to my knowledge, no. You, you, I think we, we've done so much research, uh, I would be very, very uh, surprised if something like this existed. But it's patchable currently with updates. Uh, all of these uh, vulnerabilities uh, concerning DLL loading and Excel loading, or only some of them? Uh, actually, every application has to be fixed separately. Okay. Uh, what you can do right now is apply Microsoft's hotfix, which will, based on your configuration that you choose, which will eliminate loading from the current working directory for all applications under certain circumstances. So, so it's very easy to, to uh, prevent remote attacks because that, that hotfix can easily uh, eliminate the loading from uh, current working directory on remote shares, which is the default configuration, which is very good. That's job well done by Microsoft. But that only works for DLLs, and that only works for remote attacks. So if you work from a, a zip archive on, or from a local USB disk, that doesn't protect you. Do you have a question there? Yeah. 
So I have a question and a comment. Uh, so the comment is actually to what uh, the gentleman was suggesting. So the hotfix uh, that you mentioned, they just disable the uh, CWD to be looked at, but um, that affects all applications, so it can break some applications. Why can't you just uh, put a hook on the load DLL uh, function functionality in Windows, and your hook is essentially going to just look at where the application is looking. You can have a white list of available applications that you allow to contact remotely, uh, but it seems like a fairly simple uh, thing to implement. Um, and the question is, uh, I wasn't sure if you answered it, uh, is this type of attack possible in uh, Linux environments? Uh, this particular type uh, is, is not possible. I mean, Linux works differently, although it does uh, have uh, a, a specific algorithm for finding uh, shared objects. Uh, I don't think we've found, we've heard of any way to do this remotely because uh, Windows are really f much friendlier than Linux in terms of uh, using remote resources. So th there's no, no web dev redirector. There's no way to, to go through the firewall so easily. So uh, Linux has similar issues. Uh, you can find them uh, uh, on the internet. And they, they've been known, for example, f I, I think longer than these. Uh, just, we just didn't look into the Linux stuff so much uh, as we did at, at Windows. Uh, just, uh, sorry, the, the first comment was uh, ab about hooking the load library function. Yes, uh, it's easy to hook load library functions. I mean, Microsoft, what Microsoft did was actually even better, they, they change the behavior of load library function, which is more, more efficient. But uh, it's impossible to know in advance whether an application actually needs this functionality, loading from a current working directory. Those applications that break are relying on this functionality. But uh, you can hook the function in a way that you have a white list of applications, as I understood the guy. So you can, uh, you can do that. You can have a white list of applications that do bad stuff, load uh, uh, necessary functionality from DLLs via mm -hmm. uh, not absolute path, a relative path. And then you can have a white list and look at the application doing this and allow it or not allow it. So I think it might be possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can already do this. Microsoft Hotfix allows for a global setting, and then you can specifically uh, set this uh, functionality for any particular application. So, so uh, you can, uh, for example, use the uh, maximum protection provided by this Hotfix, and then when you see that, uh, for example, Outlook, uh, Outlook's right-click functionality breaks, then you can uh, just, well, that's, that's actually what happens. You cannot right click on, on, a, on an email message anymore. Uh, so when that happens, you just add uh, uh, a specific setting, uh, which is a little less strict for Microsoft Outlook, but it works for the entire application. So yeah, you can do that. It's a lot of work. Uh, to add on this, um, you said you found 100 or more applications which are vulnerable. And they gave a list of reasons why they should be vulnerable. Do you have any check of how many of those are vulnerable because they are just uh, checking for some DLLs? And how many of them are really use, uh, vulnerable because they actually use this feature? Uh, no, we, we were just looking for those who are vulnerable. Uh, but well, wh what you're asking is probably this. I have an extra slide for this. Uh, yeah, maybe. I do. Oh, the early ones. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's what you have. So, in in the set of all existing Windows applications, you have a subset of those that are binary planting positive. That's what we call them. They are vulnerable to binary planting, which means they are loading their DLLs and in, in an insecure way, uh, and which eventually results in them loading from the current working directory. And then we have another subset, uh, which might have quite a number of uh, same members, which we call CWD addicted applications, which are those that actually break if you, if you install Microsoft's hotfix and set it to max. Those are the applications that are the reason why Microsoft cannot today make uh, 
simple update to the to the way that these library loading functions behave and just eliminate the current working directory. Those are the applications that break. But you also have some applications that are in both these sets. You have applications which uh, are vulnerable and at the same time will break if you disallow for the entire application loading of libraries from the current working directory. Th does this answer your question? Excellent. No idea. No yeah, idea numbers on, on the sizes. We just and know that this set has at least 200 okay. members. That's um, all we know. And, and the other one has at least five. <laughs> okay, I was pretty, pretty wondering how you can build an application which is uh, addicted but not vulnerable, which is interesting. Uh, how you can build an application which is CWD addicted but not binary planting positive. You need some, some very interesting. Okay, I think we have to stop here.